Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study here at Commissary. And we welcome those of you that are on Facebook. We are in the book of Revelation, and we were in chapter 13 last week. But tonight, uh, we're going to do a little review. We've not done that in a while, and so we're going to go ahead and do a little review. But first of all, let's uh, make a few announcements. Um, <coughs> Probably all of you know about the passing of Shirley McAvoy, and visitation will be from 6 to 8 tomorrow night at Heath Funeral Home, and the funeral will be there at 10 o'clock on Friday morning. And we are furnishing a meal for them after the funeral in our fellowship building. Have several uh, that are on a prayer list. We'll mention a few. You can always look at a complete list there in your bulletin. But uh, remember Naomi Burrow and Ken Burrow. Uh, Glenda Clements and Randall Glover are supposed to have surgery soon. And uh, remember Renee Wallace and Daniel Lindsay, uh, Norma Reeves, Mac Latham, and uh, there are others. Are there any that we need to mention that we didn't mention right here? Let's go ahead and start then with a word of prayer, and then we will uh, get into our study. Father, we're very grateful that we can get together on this middle of the week to study your word. We're thankful for all your blessings, physical and spiritual. We're grateful, Father, that you look after us and that you bless us uh, every single day. And we pray that you would help us to be more appreciative of all that you do for us and to show that appreciation by the way that we live. We're thankful above all things for Jesus, for his perfect life, for his sacrificial death. We're thankful, Father, for your Holy Spirit that dwells in us. We're thankful for the written word that tells us how to be saved and how to live the Christian life. We're grateful, Father, for uh, the church worldwide. We're especially thankful for the congregation here. And we've mentioned several tonight, Father, and we know that you know each situation. And we pray that you'll be with uh, Shirley McAvoy's family and that you'll bring comfort to them and that you'll be with them in a special way during this uh, time. And uh, we pray, Father, that you'll be with these that are sick that we've mentioned, uh, be with their families, pray that you'll be with their caregivers, and that you'll bless them with what they need most at this time. Please be with us as we study from your word. Pray that we'll always be willing to take what we uh, learn and make it applicable in our everyday lives. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus, your Son and our Savior. Amen. Okay, uh, we've been in Revelation uh, for a while, and uh, we haven't reviewed for several weeks. And, uh, you know, it is our goal to finish Revelation before the Lord returns, and so maybe we'll uh, be able to do that sometime. Uh, but uh, remember that Revelation was written by John, and John identifies himself uh, in a couple, two or three places in the book of Revelation. And uh, most Bible scholars believe that this was John the Apostle, and everything points to him. Uh, so many of the books of uh, the Bible are anonymous. For example, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are anonymous. Um, but uh, this one is not. John identifies himself. Written to the seven churches of Asia, and uh, the seven churches of Asia uh, were located in what is now Turkey. And in the very first verse of the of first chapter, John lists his purpose for writing uh, this uh, book. And uh, he says, to show the things that soon must soon take place. He's basically talking about things that are going to happen uh, right away. Uh, this is not uh, a preview of the history from the first century all the way to the end of time. Uh, he does talk a little bit about last things uh, toward the end of the book of Revelation. Uh, 
heaven and, and hell and, and the judgment, second coming. Uh, but basically, it, it's a book uh, about uh, what faces the seven churches of Asia. Uh, in chapter 1, Jesus uh, is uh, said to be among the seven churches. Seven churches are described as seven lampstands, and uh, the Son of God walks among them. And of course, he's among us today. The word revelation uh, is from the Greek word apocalypsis. We say the apocalypse sometimes. And that's a word that means a revealing. And uh, so we're re revealed, uh, several things are revealed in revelation. In chapters two and three, we have uh, specific letters written from Jesus to uh, the seven churches of Asia. And uh, these churches are Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. If you're driving through Mississippi, you see some of these same uh, names of towns that are there. Uh, but the format of these letters are basically this. First of all, the Lord uh, makes a list of their positive traits. And then he lists their negative traits. And then he instructs them that they need to repent. Need to change your ways. Pretty simple. Two of the congregations had no negative traits. Church of Smyrna and the church at Philadelphia. Uh, one congregation had no positive traits. Church at Laodicea, the indifferent church. In chapter 4, we have a scene from heaven. And God is on his throne. Some of the churches had already suffered some persecution. They were going to suffer more in the future. But uh, others were going to suffer persecution, and some had. And the whole idea here is that God is in control. He's on his throne. No one has dethroned him. Uh, he's in charge. In chapter 5, uh, there is uh, uh, a scroll, a, a book sealed with seven seals. And uh, John wept because no one was found worthy uh, to open the book. Finally, Jesus, and he's described here as the Lion of Judah, uh, takes the book and he is worthy to open the book and he begins to open the seals. And as each seal is broken, something is revealed. And in chapter six, you have the first six seals which are broken. Now, seal number one, you have a man that's pictured on a white horse. And uh, there are different ideas about this. I believe it probably represents Jesus who remains in control regardless of what's happening to God's children. The second seal is broken and there's a man pictured on a red horse probably representing war and bloodshed. That was going to be a part of their, of their future. Uh, and then thirdly, a man is pictured on a black horse, third seal, and uh, probably representing famine, which is a byproduct of, of war, unfortunately. Fourth seal, a man is pictured on a pale horse, and uh, this probably represents <coughs> death which is another byproduct of war. Not everyone in war dies from, uh, from battle. They, they often die from disease and, and so forth. Then we have the fifth seal is broken and uh, the martyrs, these are individuals who have died for the cause of Christ, are pictured under the altar and they're crying out, how long, how long? And of course, when we see what's going on in the world today, we probably are tempted to say the same thing. How long is the Lord going to permit this to go on? The opening of the sixth seal represents judgment. Some people believe that this points to the final judgment. Maybe it does. My view is that it's likely talking about judgment that will come upon the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire is a culprit. The Roman Empire is responsible for much of the persecution that the Christians were suffering. But 
judgment was going to come upon on Rome at some point, uh, is my view. There's a question uh, in the sixth chapter in verse 17 where the Bible says the great day of their wrath has come and who is able to stand? Who's able to stand? Well, the question is answered in chapter 7. And when we get to chapter 7, there are four angels that are pictured standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds, winds of destruction. They are instructed to hold back the wind until the bond servants of God have been sealed. Well, this answers the question uh, in the sixth chapter, verse 17, who is going to be able to stand? The bond servants of God are going to be able to stand. And the bond servants of God are represented in two ways in chapter 7. First of all, it's represented by the 144,000. God's servants on earth. These will be protected during the storm. Not from the storm, but through the storm. Remember, uh, the Lord uh, did not uh, necessarily protect the children of Israel from the Red Sea, but he protected them through the Red Sea. And so this is a, a lesson that repeats itself over and over in the book of Revelation. Uh, and we talk about the 144,000 because there are some people in the religious world who teach only 144,000 and go to go to heaven. It's a figurative term, uh, 12 being a complete number and 12 times itself. This, the, these are God's children that are upon the earth and they're gonna be protected by, by God. And then the bond servants are also represented by the multitudes. Uh, and these are God's servants who have died and are now in heaven. They've come through the tribulation, they've come through the storms of life, and they now stand before the throne of God. That's pretty much the picture that you get in chapter seven. And then in chapter eight, the seventh seal is broken. And there's silence in heaven for half an hour. We're not told exactly what that means. But seven angels are given seven trumpets. And another angel stands at the altar holding a golden censer. And the Bible says much incense is given to him. And he adds the incense to the prayers of all the saints. The prayers are on the altar. And these all go up in smoke. The incense with the, with the, the smoke goes up to God, representing prayers. Uh, then it, it gets confusing, as is often a case in Revelation. Uh, the angel took the censer, and he filled it with fire, and he threw it to the earth. The idea uh, in, in the minds of some scholars is that prayer works. Uh, he's, he's going to take out his, his wrath uh, upon, upon the evildoers. Uh, and, and one reason that, that he's going to do that is because the prayers have, have come up before him. We have the, the trumpets. They announce God's judgments on the world. Seals reveal, and as each seal was, was broken, something would be uh, revealed. Uh, and uh, what we've learned is that uh, God's going to deal with evil. He's in control. Uh, trumpets warn. And these trumpets, uh, I don't think, represent the final judgment because only a third of the earth is going to be affected. Now, at the end of time, uh, according to Second Peter 3, the, the entire world is, is going to be destroyed. But these are warnings. Uh, these, these trumpets as they're blown. You have the first trumpet sounds, and uh, you get a picture of fire and hail mixed with uh, blood, probably the blood of the enemy, and God sends plagues upon evil men. Second trumpet, something like a great mountain uh, is burning and is thrown into the sea. Uh, in the Old Testament, uh, uh, 
mountains sometimes represent nations. And it could be that this mountain represents a nation and probably Rome. And uh, Rome had a great presence upon the sea, especially the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, they were a, a nation that did a lot of uh, trading, a lot of commerce, and, uh, and, and there's, there's a day that all that's going to come to an end, seems to be what is being said here. Then you had the third trumpet, and uh, we're told that a great star falls from heaven, and the star is called Wormwood. Wormwood is another word for bitterness. And uh, this is a judgment on fresh waters, not, not sea waters. And this could be perhaps, and keep in mind I'm saying perhaps, a judgment on pagans who worshiped uh, uh, rivers. Yeah, the fourth trumpet, and uh, a third of the sun, moon, and stars were struck. It's a great disaster. It's hard to tell exactly what. Uh, but you look at verse uh, 13 here in, in chapter 8. Look at, look at verse 13. And uh, uh, John says, Then I looked, and I heard an eagle flying in mid-heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth because of the remaining blast of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. This is another way of saying you ain't seen nothing yet. Uh, warning about what's going to come. We get to the ninth uh, chapter and you have the fifth trumpet. And uh, John uh, saw a star fall from heaven, uh, falls to the earth, and uh, he was given a key to the bottomless pit. There are many theories about who the star was or who it represented. Some say it represented uh, Nero. Some say, well, a fallen angel. Some say an evil spirit. Some say Satan. We're not told. And uh, he's, he's given a key, and a key would represent authority or control. And out of the pit arose smoke, and the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke. And out of the smoke came locusts, who were told to only hurt those who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Locusts represent destruction. You remember when the 10 plagues came upon uh, the Egyptians, one of those plagues was locusts. And uh, locusts can uh, come upon uh, the country and completely destroy crops, vegetation, and, and so forth. Uh, and uh, they were not permitted to kill anyone uh, but to torment for five months. Five months probably represents a short period of time, probably not literal. And the locusts have a king over them, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek it's Apollyon. And these names mean uh, destroyer. Uh, and, uh, you know, that gets a little confusing, but the entire scene points to the fact that destruction awaits the disobedient. Now, the, the book of Revelation is a book of hope. A lot of people don't look at it that way. Uh, and, and, and I believe that Revelation was written to give the, the seven churches, and, and the, the church of the first century especially, and, and the second part of the second century, uh, hope. You know, they were being persecuted. Uh, there, there were other... Uh, uh, natural disasters that awaited them. It's difficult times. And, and John writes this, giving them hope. And, and he said, now the, the disobedient, uh, you know, they're, they're going to face the wrath of God. And it seems to me that he is uh, saying that here. And then also in chapter 9, you have the six trumpet sounds. And the four angels are released who were bound at the Euphrates River. Uh, again, uh, uh, you know, Euphrates River was an actual river, uh, but he probably is again speaking figuratively here. And they were released to kill a third of mankind. Uh, again, not everyone, so we're not talking about the end of the world. But uh, the rest of mankind, even though they'd seen this destruction, did not repent. 
seems to be human nature. It's some people, you, you just can't get them to change their ways. And then we get to chapter 10. And in chapter 10, uh, you, you have uh, uh, an angel uh, from heaven. Uh, and uh, he has a little book. And some people think that this is uh, the Bible, perhaps. Some say it's the New Testament. But it's, it's probably just a message of, of warning. This angel has his right foot on the sea and his left foot on land. And, and perhaps that uh, uh, brings a message that, that, that this lesson was for the whole world. It's for land and sea. It's for everyone. And uh, we're told that uh, uh, he had, uh, he was loud like a lion, tension getter. Get people, we, we need someone to get our attention sometimes. Uh, and then he was told, seal up uh, the book. Why? Well, there was to be no more warnings. If you look at verse 6 in chapter 10, um, but let's look at verses 5 and 6. Then the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land lifted up his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things in it and the earth and the things in it and the sea and the things in it, that there will be delay no longer. Uh, and so uh, he said, we're not going to say anymore. Everything that needs to be said has been said. Uh, that's, that's the message. Uh, and, and he said, uh, uh, the mystery's finished. There's nothing more to say, nothing to add. The, the message has been delivered. The people didn't repent. Uh, and uh, he is told then to, uh, John is told to take the book and to, and, and to eat the book. Uh, reminds us of Ezekiel when he was told to eat a book over in Ezekiel, the third chapter. And in his mouth it was sweet, but in his stomach it uh, was, was bitter. Uh, the sweetness could represent the wonderful promises of God, and the bitterness could represent the judgment of God upon those that are disobedient. Uh, and, and as he concludes chapter 10, uh, verse 11 says, And they said to me, You must prophesy again concerning many peoples, nations, and tongues, and kings. John, you've got a responsibility uh, to get the word out. And of course, we have a responsibility too. We get to chapter 11, uh, which we got to a month or so ago. Leon Morris said, chapter 11 of Revelation is extraordinarily difficult to interpret. Well, Anyone who's read Revelation would agree with that. Bruce Metzger said, this chapter has been generally acknowledged to be one of the most perplexing sections of the whole book. And Martin Kittle said, this chapter is at once the most difficult and the most important in the whole book of Revelation. You know, in the introduction to, to Revelation, uh, which we did not go over tonight, uh, you had different schools of thought. You had the literists, the futurists, those who had the historical view, the preterists who believe everything has pretty well been fulfilled. And different schools of thought have different ideas as to what chapter 11 uh, means. And you, you can go to commentary after commentary and, and get uh, different, different ideas. But in chapter 11, John is given a measuring rod. And he's told to measure the temple of God. And again, this uh, reminds us of, of uh, uh, Ezekiel when he's told to, to measure the temple. Well, the temple was built by Solomon uh, around 950 B.C. or so. And uh, it was destroyed in 586 B.C. by Nebuchadnezzar when the Babylonians uh, uh, de destroyed Jerusalem and carried the people into captivity. In 539, Babylon uh, fell to the Medes and the Persians. 
And at 536, Zerubbabel was allowed to return. Uh, the Medes and the Persians allowed him to return to Jerusalem for the purpose of rebuilding the temple. And, uh, you know, they, they, they didn't build it right away. It took them 20 years. They quit building for about 15 years. But uh, God raised up Zechariah and, and Haggai to urge the people to get the building again. And it was finished in 516. In uh, 20 B.C., Herod the Great, you remember him, he started remodeling the temple. And in John, the uh, second chapter, we're told that the remodeling had been in, in progress for 46 years. But it was completed, but the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D. when the Romans uh, conquered Jerusalem. The temple doesn't exist. Uh, it didn't exist at the time Revelation was written. And yet, uh, John is told to measure the temple. Again, we're talking about a, a book of... Uh, of figures, we're talking about symbolic language. He's not talking about the literal uh, temple. Uh, the temple can refer to the human body. First Corinthians six uh, gives us uh, that picture. You know, our our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. We're told, uh, but it can also refer to the church. Uh, and in First Corinthians three, the church is is called a temple. And it would seem to me that he is saying, you measure the church. Uh, you, you measure, and, and what makes up a church? It's not brick and mortar. Uh, it's people. You, you, you measure the people to make sure that they're living as, as they should. Uh, and what, what was the measuring rod? You know. Uh, well, it, it, it wasn't, you know, rod was what, 18 inches uh, long? It wasn't a yardstick or anything like that. I believe that uh, it was the Word of God. Uh, how do we measure ourselves today? It's by the Word of God. Jesus said, he who rejects me and receives, uh, doesn't receive me, has one that judges him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. John 12 and verse 48. Uh, and so the whole purpose is to protect God's people. And so you measure, measure the church. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, chapter 11 is pretty, pretty difficult. And then he mentions here, and I, uh, we're only going to get through chapter, chapter uh, 11, but uh, we, we need to review a little bit. Two witnesses are, are uh, mentioned. Uh, and, and they're going to prophesy for 1,260 days, 42 months, or three and a half years. We're not told who the two witnesses were. All kinds of suggestions, and you know, you can read, again, commentary after commentary. Some say, well, Moses and Elijah. Some say Elijah and Elisha. Some say the law and the prophets, the law and the gospels, the Old Testament or New Testament, uh, Peter and Paul, uh, God's word and God's church. The apostles and prophets, we're just not told. Uh, but the two, I think, probably symbolize strength. During trying times, the gospel would continue to be preached, and the children of God would be protected. And this is what was going to happen. Uh, hard times are coming, and, and the purpose of the church would be carried out, even in times of adversity. Uh, and, and that's basically the message that, that I get from, from uh, chapter 11, uh, and, and there's more in chapter 11, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll finish the review next week and then get into chapter 14, and you might want to be looking at those, uh, at those uh, questions. And we'll take a break here, and in a few minutes we'll have announcements in, in our devotional. Good evening. Good to see everybody. Well, it's the people on Facebook that are watching. We're glad that everybody is taking part in the service tonight. We've got several announcements. At first, I'd like to remind you to silence your electronic devices if you haven't already done so. Reminder of our services, Sunday morning at 9.30, worship at 10.05, and then Sunday evening at 5.30, Wednesday night at 7.00. 
This would also be a good time for me to remind you that the evening services for December 24th have been dismissed. There will be no Sunday night services this coming Sunday. Give people more time to spend with their family and friends and just have a Devo on your own. We've got several announcements tonight, not nearly as many as maybe we had Sunday, but I'm sure everybody knows by now that Shirley McElvoy passed away earlier this week. Her visitation will be tomorrow night from 6 to 8 at Heath's funeral home, and then the funeral will be at Heath's at 10 o'clock on Friday morning. And Charlie reminded me a while ago there will be a meal after the funeral on Friday, and so we might need a few extra folks to help with that because I'm sure a lot of people will be at the funeral and then be having to get food out here and he also said that they would send out a text reminder to everybody so just Evan says maybe have the food out here by about 11 30 and I'm not sure how we'll do all that and go to the funeral but ladies generally figure it out so but yeah what we'll what we'll need to do. Also, you remember that Chubb just had shoulder surgery and carpal tunnel surgery, and he was at home recuperating from that. So we need to keep that family in our prayers, obviously. We also need to continue to remember Braden Sesson's family, who was Lisa Glover's nephew, and he died in an auto accident last week. We need to continue to remember that family as well. Also, Kyla Penny has been moved from MD Anderson to St. Bernard's, and obviously she's not doing well, so we need to continue to remember them. My grandson-in-law is still in the hospital in Chicago on that trip that they made. What a thing, take a trip, get put in the hospital. But he is much better, so that's all looking up as well. Is there anything else? Are there any other announcements that need to be made, Evan? Yeah, I found out tonight that Thomas Lindsay's not doing, not feeling well, so we need to check on him. And also, Jodine Ellis uh, is not doing well. And we need to remember her in our prayers, and I'll try to send out a message about her. Okay. So, I, and I don't really have any details on Thomas, just not feeling well. Okay, Thomas Lindsay and who? Jodine Ellis. Jodine Ellis are both not feeling well, so we need to keep them in our prayers as well. Is there anything else? Anybody else that may have overlooked? If not, those that are participating in our service tonight, Wes will be leading our singing. Wade Taylor will lead us in our opening prayer. Our closing prayer will be Brian Oden, and our speaker will be Brian Oden as well. So double duty on him tonight. At this time, Wade, I believe it's in your opening prayer. Let's pray together. Gracious Father in heaven, we come to you to thank you this evening uh, that we can come together and as your church and take a time out in the busyness of the week and have fellowship and worship you and study your word and lift up our praises and song to you, Father. Father, we pray to you tonight for we have on our minds and our hearts those that are sick, those that have been injured. Father, we also pray for those who have lost their loved ones. We are so thankful for the hope that we all have that for those that have passed on that they have a better life waiting on them. We find that hope through our faith in you, God, and our, for our faith and our love in you. We are so thankful in the comfort that can be had, the comfort that only you can provide, uh, the peace that only you can provide, Father. We also uh, want to thank you for Jesus, your son, and the price he paid to offer forgiveness of our sins so that we may all have eternal life with you. Father, we pray all of this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Four hundred and forty two. Four forty two.
Do you suppose, O man who judges those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the righteousness of kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of you, hard and impotent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath when God's righteousness judgment will be revealed. I know when I read things like this, I think to myself, I have a tendency to think of judgment as an all-encompassing word. That when we talk about passing judgment, we talk of somebody being guilty of something. But when we start to look at what he's talking about here, and Paul writes this stuff, and he's listing all these, it sounds a lot like the things he's talking about in, in 1 John when we read the fruits of the, or the, the, uh, the works of the flesh. Um, if, you, if you turn over to Galatians chapter 5, um, the works of the flesh are these. Uh, but if you're led by the Spirit and you're not under the law, now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and all things like these. When we stop and we think about the word judgment, judgment is not just simply sentencing someone to hell, saying that what they believe is wrong. I think there's a time and a place that we have to look at things that we believe and we have to make a stand on that. But we as individuals, we as Christians, we have to stop and we have to, we are so readily to jump on somebody else for maybe something that they do. And we, we look at people's decisions and their actions and we want to place blame we want to identify, we want to label what they're doing. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to share a couple small stories with you about just things that I've come across through the course of time that kind of leads us <coughs> to opportunity to maybe pass judgment. Several years ago, uh, we responded to a fire call in Jonesboro, and we responded to a, uh, this lady called, and she said that she could hear the fire in her house, in her attic. And we pulled up on the scene that she was an older lady. Uh, I, I don't know how she was, but she was quite up in age. And she was quite fable, or afraid of people and frail, and she was getting around kind of slow. And she was very insistent that she could hear the fire in her attic. Well, it was quite obvious once we got there and we started walking down the hall that there was not a fire in this house, but you could not convince her of such. And it wasn't like something like dementia. She was very intent that she heard something that in her mind she perceived that something was on fire. Now it would have been very easy for us to just dismiss it like she's just this crazy old lady and then just kind of dismiss her like that. But I began to think about, well, how many of us, how many, how many of, of do, do we awaken in the middle of the night and we hear something? And our mind starts to run away with it. So we think about our kids at home by themselves. And they hear something that maybe you and I have learned to define Maybe it's just the ice maker, or it's the dog barking, or it's something else. But we sit there, and we listen to this lady, and if we would have dismissed her, then she would have been up all night. If we would have labeled her, if we would have judged her as being crazy, or just worried about something that's nothing. Now, I understand that that's not necessarily what Paul's talking about in the term judgment, but I'm trying to make the parallel between judgment and love. Because when we talk about the fruits of the Spirit, that's where this comes from, because the more we love, the less likely we are to judge. And I'm not talking about the judgment of sending someone to hell, but the judgment of less looking at each other through the eyes of our own selves and the things that we've endured and trying to get a better understanding of maybe what somebody's going through. So as we sat there and I returned the other units to this lady's house, I was going to spend some time with her and try to figure out what she was hearing. So we crawled up in the attic, the attic was clear, and, and she, was, she was so apologetic, I'm sorry, I'm wasting your time, I'm wasting your, I'm like, no, it's fine, don't worry about it, you know. And then she said, there it is again, do you hear it? And I could hear it, and I couldn't figure out what it was until I crawled back in the attic. And the wind was blowing, and her worry word was striking a tree limb, and it sounded exactly like a fire crackling in the attic. So we crawled up out the attic, broke a couple of tree limbs back, and she was satisfied. So the small effort of listening to somebody and not passing judgment as the crazy lady or whatever, let's, let's insert ourselves to anything like that. We're so quick to judge 
people's situations. Maybe, maybe where you come from dictates how you interpret a certain situation. We want to sit there and say, well, it's careless for you to look at the situation and think, well, there's no sense in getting upset about that, but you don't know the path that that person's traveled. We have to be careful when we place judgment. Um, when we go down the road, when we, when we run across people that ask us for help, Britt and I went several years ago uh, to Chicago, and I don't know if anybody's ever been in big cities, Joan grows get the same way, Bear grows the same way. You find panhandlers on every street corner. And as we were approached by multiple people, it's like people are always asking for help and for handouts. And at first you become, I was a little taken back because there were so many people that were asking for these handouts. And I began to think about, well, you know, well, they're probably drunks, so they're probably gonna go buy drugs with it. And you, and you begin to have this callous mindset, this callous judgment of what they're gonna do with it. And I began to really struggle with it because the Bible tells us in 1 John 17 that if we have God's means, if we have goods that we can help others with, then it's our responsibility to do it. And if they misuse that, if they abuse that, that's on them. That's not on us. Now, granted, that doesn't mean we should do $20 bills at anybody that asks for help. But we need to be slower to judge and quicker to love people that ask us for help. Um, if we turn over to 1 John, I'd like to close 1 John chapter 3. <clears throat> Starting in verse... Uh, for this is the message that you have heard from the beginning that we should love one another we should not be like Cain who was evil one with his murdered his brother and why did he murder him because of his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteousness do not be surprised brothers that that the world hates you we know that we have passed out into death into life because we love the brothers Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and that we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. But if anyone, anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or deed or talk, but in deed and in truth. I saw something uh, on Facebook the other day, and uh, it was actually something that uh, Art and Brenda's daughter, Ashley, had posted. And it really got me to thinking, and it actually tied together really well with this. It said, the test of, a true, of true Christianity is not those who love Jesus, but those who love Judas. And it's like, that's that, that, that's, that's really truthful. Judas is the one part of love. He's going to love Jesus. But if he's going to find ways to love Judas. So as we enter this holiday season, let's think about how we can judge less and love more. If anybody has anything we can help you do, please come to us together and stand and sing. Oh, the death and the riches of God's saving grace flowing down from the cross for me. There the death for my sins by the Savior was paid in his suffering on Calvary. Oh, the death of such wonderful love, boundless and full and free. And the death for my sins was all paid in his suffering on Calvary. Oh, a marvelous mercy, what By his blood I am cleansed, I am happy and free, through his suffering on Calvary. Oh, the death of such wonderful love, flowing boundless and full and free. And the death for my sins was all paid, in his suffering on Calvary. Pray with me, please. Father, we're so thankful for loving us. 
We're so, Father, we're so thankful for your willingness to send your Son to die on the cross to save us from our sin. Father, we ask that you please lift up those that have lost loved ones. We ask that you comfort them as only you can. And Father, please look upon those that are sick, that of our number, and we ask that you restore a portion of their health, Father, for be your will. Father, we ask that you give us the courage to look to you for guidance. Allow us to study your word and find comfort in your will. Be with us as we travel and forgive us when we fail you. In Jesus' name, amen.